Chapter Eight of Dave Dawson on Guadalcanal by Robert Sidney Bowen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Eagle's Eyes. When darkness settled down, the two carrier task force changed course to due north, spread out considerably, and went churning forward at full knots, with not so much as a speck of light showing any place. For a couple of hours after evening mess, Dawson and Farmer loafed around on deck, as did almost everybody else who was not on duty. Little was spoken, though, in the way of conversation, and then only in low tones. From bow to stern, and from keel to signal bridge, there prevailed an atmosphere of tense, silent excitement. Everybody aboard knew that the task force would pass almost within a stone's throw of the jack-occupied Solomons sometime during the night, and every other split second at least a hundred pair of eyes peered out over the port rail at the wall of night to the west. Eventually, though, the desire for sleep was stronger than the desire to remain awake just in case, and so one by one the pilots went below, and Dave and Freddy were among the first in the parade. This isn't any pleasure cruise, so we might as well catch all the shut-eye we can, Dave summed it up, as he stretched out in his bunk. It's a cinch. The Admiral isn't going to send word around when we reach the closest point to the Solomons. So why stay up on deck, staring at nothing but darkness? Quite, Freddy murmured. And if the force is sighted, we'll know about it soon enough. Now isn't that a sweet thought to go to sleep on, Dave growled, and rolled over on his side. See you in the morning, sweetheart. Stay up and worry if you want to, but not me. Who said who was worrying? The English youth snapped. I was only remarking that. Freddy cut himself off short and glared at Dawson's bunk. A faint snore told him that he was addressing an audience that consisted of only himself. He made a face, snapped off the light, and pulled aside the blackout curtains over the ports to let in the night air, and then stretched out himself and thought of his homeland, many thousands of miles away. However, he didn't think of England for very long. Sleep soon pulled down his eyelids, and off he drifted. The next thing either of them knew was the blaring of the intership alarm siren, and the hubbub and scuffle of activity on the deck above. Instantly, both were wide awake and leaping out of their bunks. Trouble, Dave snapped. Let's go. Hey, it's light. We must be past the Solomons. There's one way to find out, Freddy shot back at him, and grabbed up his helmet and goggles. Dawson, also, had slept in his clothes so as to be ready for any emergency. So he grabbed his helmet and goggles and followed Freddy out of the cabin. When they reached the flight deck, it was to find that all the commotion was caused by the carrier's early patrol, getting off for a quick look-see ahead. There was no sign of enemy planes in the dawn-tinted heavens. In fact, as Dawson took a good look toward all four points of the compass, he realized that there was no sign of anything save the flock of ships that made up the task force, and countless square miles of rolling blue-green ocean. He turned to Freddy to make some remark about the situation, but checked the words as Donald Duck blared out an announcement. All pilots assigned to special duty will go below for breakfast, and then report to the ready room for briefing. That's us, Freddy old, Dave began, and stopped short. The English youth was already on his way down to eat. Dave chuckled, gave a little shake of his head, and followed his pal. And just thirty minutes later, all of the special assignment pilots were gathered in the ready room. Colonel Welsh and the executive flight officer were there, and the colonel started talking as soon as the last pilot to arrive had seated himself. Well, we made it, we think, he began. Nothing was sighted last night, and right now we're on the edge of the area to be searched. 
The searching patrols are to be made in relays. That is, all of you will go out and fly your patrols. And as soon as you are returning to refuel, the Hawk will launch her planes to take up where you left off. Here on the table in front of me are envelopes containing patrol courses and instructions for every flying team. Your names are printed on the outside. So before you leave, come up and get your envelope. Well, I guess that's all, except this. We feel, now, that the Jap snooper business late yesterday afternoon didn't do us any harm. At least we hope and pray that it is like that. However, there is just a chance that the Japs have managed to trail us somehow and will attempt to cross us up by launching a land-based attack. For that reason, keep your radios open all the time you are in the air. You may get the call to come back here in a hurry. The colonel paused, started to make a gesture of dismissal, but checked himself. Now there's one more thing I'd better mention, though you'll find it included in your sealed orders, he said, and it is this. The safety of this task force is of prime importance, at least until we have found this unknown Jap force and are engaging it. I mean by that, if any of you get into any personal trouble, such as being jumped by surprise by Jap planes, or something goes wrong that forces you down into the drink, don't count on any help from this task force. You will be strictly on your own. In short, as you will learn when you read your individual orders, you are not to make radio contact with this task force, unless you sight Jap surface units of three or more ships in number. One reason for that is to prevent any Japs from listening in on your wavelengths and learning of the force's existence in these waters by taking a bearing to locate our position. And the reason it must be three or more Jap ships that you sight is because the Japs might possibly try to decoy us into a favorable position for them. Well, that is all now. Good luck and Godspeed to all of you. We have two days and one night in which to accomplish this mighty difficult job. If we don't sight that Jap force today, then we've absolutely got to do it tomorrow. The attack on Guadalcanal and Tulagi will begin on the morning of the third day, whether we succeed or fail. And so it's up to you pilots, and I know you'll make the grade. Good luck again. As the colonel stopped talking, there was no burst of applause or anything like that from the pilots. Each man simply nodded gravely and then went up to the table to collect his sealed orders. Dave got the envelope for Freddy and himself, and without stopping to open it, the pair hurried topside to where their aircraft was waiting, with prop already ticking over. Settling themselves in the aircraft, they took out their orders and read them over carefully. The course they were to fly extended out over the water for some 350 miles, in a dead northwest direction. They were to keep at an altitude of 8,000 feet, unless clouds or storms interfered, and their code call was to be Tiger, just as it had been yesterday. Okay, Mr. Navigator, Dave said, and passed the course chart over to Freddy. You keep track of our position, pal, and don't bother to explain if you get us lost. Just jump over the side and leave your parachute behind, see? Oh, really, the English youth growled. But don't worry about me, my good man. I'll take care of my end, thank you. Just concentrate on keeping us in the air. Matter of fact, I think it's rather silly of me to take you along. Perhaps I should speak of that to Colonel Welsh right now. Do, sweetheart, by all means, Dawson snarled and pointed a finger toward the sky. I'll be up there waiting for you when you get back. Freddy started to say something in return, but checked himself as he caught sight of the signal officer pointing his flag. Get going, Dave, he said, and winked. Off we go. And luck to both of us, old thing. Right on the beam, pal, Dawson replied and turned front. You, me, and this baby with wings. Maybe we'll all be heroes of the task force come sundown. You be the hero, Freddy laughed at him. All I want to be is lucky and find the Jap force. 
And you've really got something there, kid, Dawson agreed instantly, and then gave his attention to the flag-pointing signal officer on the flight bridge. Just three minutes and twenty seconds later, Dawson took the Dauntless off the flight deck and nosed it up toward the early morning sky. He kept on going up until the altimeter said eight thousand feet. Then he leveled off and set his course according to the instructions Freddy Farmer gave him, took a last look down at the Carson that was launching her planes at the rate of one every fifteen seconds, and then turned front and settled himself comfortably in the seat. Minutes later, the task force was out of sight, far behind, and Freddy and he were alone in a world of dawn light and limitless expanse of ocean below. End of chapter 8